Many of us already use artificial intelligence in our everyday lives, whether it's using our faces to unlock our phone or asking Siri to send a text or telling Alexa to skip that song. But what about when it comes to our health and well-being? Using AI, doctors can plug in a patient's details and symptoms and almost instantly get back a potential diagnosis, even a medical plan. But AI programs get their information from the humans and our human input. So their analysis is not always foolproof and biases can slip through the cracks. That's why the FDA released new guidance last week aimed at ensuring AI technology has the ability to be modified to respond to new information to, quote, identify and eliminate that bias. One of my next guests shares that caution. Dr. Mark Succi is an emergency radiologist at Mass General Hospital. And I'm also joined by Regina Barzilai, faculty lead for MIT's Abdul Latif Jamil Clinic for Machine Learning in Health. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining me. Um, doctor, I, I want to start with you first and tell, share with you my personal experience. Uh, and I'm sharing this with my daughter's permission. She has had... Uh, a 10-year medical journey with some of the best doctors in the city um, and just recently, two years ago, got a diagnosis, took 10 years to get to. When ChatGPT came out, I read her symptoms into <laughs> the GPT, write this, and in 10 seconds it came out with the diagnosis that one of the best doctors in the world had come up with. Um, I posted it on Facebook and a number of medical professionals immediately pushed back on me saying, hold your horses. Um, is my experience like completely crazy or is that what the future may hold for us? First of all, thank you for having me. And I don't think it's crazy at all. Um, I think that the newest language models, um, large language models from chat GPT, including GPT-4 are incredibly powerful. Um, you think about just having every literature article, hundreds of thousands of pieces of data available, and to make those patterns and connections behind the scenes in ways physicians, including your daughter's physician, might not have thought about before, is and, and to do it in seconds, not years, is incredibly powerful. Um, I think it's, it's right on the money. And when we look at chat GPT actually performing in these clinical scenarios, you know, they're at about the level of an intern, um, which is a, a recent med school graduate. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, I want to show one of the um, the, the data points here that from a two, 2023 study on uh, chat GPT's ability to make a clinical decision, uh, overall, the accuracy was 72 percent. The final diagnosis, 77 percent. And the differential diagnosis was 60 percent. Um, and as you point out, uh, that's kind of just how a, a new intern would be doing on the floor, which, uh, Regina, that leads me to you, what should we be concerned about here? I'm all like, this is great, but I'm sure there's a, a dark side to the dark GPT, right? So first, uh, thank you for having me. And second, I'm actually very enthusiastic. And I think the part that I'm personally concerned uh, is how little of it we are using it today in clinical care because we are really overemphasizing the dangers but at the same time what worries me a lot that you know I moved to this field maybe in 2016 due to my own misdiagnosis and how little of AI we actually seen and there is no even a comprehensive study that shows this penetration but if we all are thinking about our experiences as patients when we are getting to the hospitals we see very very little of it so I'm a bit concerned that the public discourse uh, is now tilted on the dangers rather than thinking this is a great opportunity and it can you know together with the clinical professionals, improve the quality of care and decrease the cost. Yeah, I mean, doctor, we want to make sure we un we underscore this. We don't want any um, GPT diagnosing us and giving us a medical plan without speaking to a qualified medical professional uh, at input. But at the same time, we've all been there. You know, we think we have something. Uh, we Google it. We go in to talk to our doctor and we say the Internet said and our doctor says, of course, the Internet said the Internet also says this and that's wrong. Um, how is your profession sort of reacting to uh, this powerful tool that almost anyone's going to have access to? And how do we qualify it and modify it? I think overall, it's it's similar to what Regina said. It's extremely uh, bullish. Um, we're very excited about it. Uh, and it's been in the works for a few years. Um, and we're just at the process of benchmarking the initial GPT-3, now GPT-4 performances. Um, one thing I, I do want to underscore is that there's a lot of talk about doctors being replaced. Typically in the AI field, 
Um, doctors will be replaced, but not by AI. I think they'll be replaced by doctors who leverage AI to make themselves more efficient, more accurate. One thing I was just thinking about on uh, the way to this interview is how especially primary care physicians are overburdened by paperwork, billing, arguing with insurance companies. And now all of a sudden we have a, a chatbot, an extremely user-friendly chatbot that can write insurance appeal letters, that can pull billing codes out of patient notes. And that has huge implications for the practice of medicine. If you can give a primary care doctor back two hours of their day, that's two hours of seeing more patients, better patient access. That's two hours of maybe a break for once, and physician wellness, and overall uh, more efficiency, so that satisfies the financial managers. Yeah, Dr. Zucci, that was going to be my next question. As frequent flyers uh, at, at my family with five specialists, uh, we just took us four months to get a medicine approved, and the doctor's office, you know, didn't fit, didn't have all the information from the medical chart, so we got rejected. Then we had to go back, and then we had to interact with the pharmacy, and then we're waiting for someone in the other doctor's office to call us back to set up this appointment. Your expectation is that Chat, chat GPT would be able to take care a lot of that, and plus the faxing. I don't want to even get into why I'm still faxing <laughs> and looking for a fax machine, but Chat GPT might be able to do all of those things I, th I think so and i think that's that's even doable possibly now with some safeguards and hipaa compliance um, that's most exciting to us because um, we can have the best care in boston the most cutting edge care if you can't access it it doesn't matter regina i'm getting pushback from um some people uh some people in the pharmaceutical business who um I'm hearing, wow, this really could cut down on human trials. This can do predictions on how certain people might react to certain medicines. I thought they'd be excited about it. Apparently, they're not as excited about it as I am. What, what are you seeing as the resistance here? Besides the fact, you know, we all just went through crypto. Didn't turn out to be as big as it was. So there's always the reaction of the brand new shiny thing. But what do you think the reaction here is to the resistance to be at least open minded about this? So you, actually, I work a lot with the pharmaceutical company and, companies and I think a lot of AI is already in the companies and it's used every day in the discovery and optimizing the trials, but there are people who feel resistance. And I think part of it, uh, and I'm sorry, Dr. Sochi, I think that you're not in this uh, camp, but there are many uh, clinicians who didn't study AI during their medical training. So it's just kind of a new thing. As a clinician, they feel responsibility towards their patient to ensure that it's safe, but at the same time, you don't truly understand the technology. And while well, I'm excited that the FDA come up you know, with a new set of laws, but these laws are changing all the time, and as a result, uh, you know, actually users of the technology, both clinicians and uh, the patients are a bit confused how safe is the technology. Uh, so this is one of the biggest concerns right now that a lot of, you know, public discourse focuses about the dangers rather than kind of focusing on the opportunities and identifying the safe spaces where we already can use, like some examples that Dr. Sochi, um, you know, described in uh, his talk. At the same time, though, you know, we've just been through a period with social media, break things and move fast. Uh, let's just go ahead and do things and then see what happens and see if we can fix it. Lawmakers are always trying to play catch up to technology. That's not ever going to change, right? We just kind of have to see what happens first. Um, this being in the medical field, though, and how exponentially this, this technology seems to be moving. I mean, I feel like I just got the first version in December and I'm already on the fourth version. Shouldn't there be some cautious guardrails that we are insisting get put up like before we, we, we start advocating that this is a good idea? I think that we always need to compare when we introduce a new technology with what we already have. Like, for instance, let's look at the mammograms. Right now, all the mammograms in Boston, as far as I know, are read by humans. And uh, there are a lot of statistics that demonstrate that humans make mistakes, that uh, I think one out of seven mammograms may have misdiagnosed and so on. So the question is, we can just compare the performance of the human 
versus the performance of a human augmented by a machine that can act as an extra device and an extra help. And I think that the only way for us to move forward is to do this very large-scale implementational, translational studies and really see how does it impact the patient. Unfortunately, today, most of the studies in AI are just limited to retrospective studies that you kind of look at the past, how well would it do? But the bigger question is to create these studies in the hospital environment and see does it really improve doctor's performance when you have the AI helper. Dr. Suchi, I lived through a, um, <laughs> it's not a medical emergency, I'm setting it up. I lived through a, uh, a, a paperwork and computer changeover at one of my providers. Um, and I had two appointments during the month that they were doing it. And it was as if the whole building was on fire, right? It was just like the most, and, I, and I'm, I'm joking, but I, I feel their pain whenever you have to change over. What's the appetite for uh, the medical community, the medical professionals, in understanding that this may mean there's going to be a big changeover in how we input patients' records, how we collect data, where it gets stored, and all the infrastructure and training that has to happen and go along with that. I think the appetite is definitely there, especially in Boston, where we're very technologically minded. We're, we're creating all sorts of digital systems to actually uh, do what you said. Um, behavior change in any institution, regardless of if it's in medicine or not, is extremely difficult. Um, in radiology, I'll give you an example. We used to hang films on light boxes. Uh, you may remember in the in the 90s and, and 80s, and all of a sudden we changed over to a system called PAX, which allowed us to read 10 times more studies in the same uh, time as before. So I think it's a welcome change. Um, I, Dr. Barsley said something really interesting about we just need to get it in there and it has to be supervised. I feel like if we got some of these tools doing these large scale trials, the benefit will be so clear, so advanced while being supervised. So the safety measures are there. Um, that that behavior change will be a little easier um, and will be less, uh, more frictionless. Uh, folks often are also concerned about the bias that is because humans are it's it's us. We talk about intelligence, but it's just taking the things that we have done and interpreting it. Right. Um, how can we safeguard against the biases that we may put into this uh, these systems? So bias comes from those who actually design those systems in a sense that if you are, let's say, training your model only on white population and then you apply it to African-American population, there is no guarantee that it would actually work well. And for this reason, both FDA and, you know, even scientific journals today are required to test the tools uh, in a very diverse population before publishing or clearly before the de deployment. But at the same time, we really need to have technological guards that can tell, uh, that the machine can tell us when it is not sure. Because we can try and create a diverse population as much as we want during, uh, during you know, trying the system. But once the system is already in practice, there can be some really unique case. And uh, right now at MIT, we are working on models that can actually um, help machine to say, I don't know, which is a very natural reaction. Then you say the control should actually go to the human. So there is a lot of emphasis now in machine learning to move away from just being able to predict very accurately to identify when the machine just should just say, I don't know. Well, I am so excited, and I'm glad that you both joined us to help us understand this. So uh, uh, go forth. Let's see what it brings. Thank you to both of you, Dr. Mark Succi and Regina Barzolet. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.